I am here to explain to you how to start a riot. <laughs> but first, I want to tell you a story about American football. The trophy that is currently given to the champions of the American National Football League is named after a man called Vince Lombardi. Vince had a military background and was a man of unwavering discipline and he was the head coach of the Green Bay Packers. Now, if you know anything about American football, you know that it's a bit like rugby. For you to score, you either pass or hold the ball, carry it all the way to the opponent's side of the field, up to the final line, and touch down. Vince Lombardi's strategy was very simple. He recruited the strongest, most buffed up players he could find. And his winning play is what is now known as the power sweep. And it involves a ball carrier escorted by a host of blockers ramming through the center of the field, steamrolling and crushing anybody that came in their way, all the way until they secured a touchdown. In 1967 and 1968, the Green, the Green Bay Packers won the first two championships called the Super Bowl, and since then, Vince Lombardi's influence on the, on the sport has been so far-reaching, it forms the basic culture of American football as we know it today. But what do you do if you do not have that kind of a team? How do you win if all you have are nimble players? In 1979, Bill Walsh took over as the head coach of the San Francisco 49ers. The 49ers were a pathetic, underperforming team. They had only won two matches their previous season and to date hold the record for the longest losing streak. They operated from rundown facilities and did not have the resources required of them to purchase players that they needed to win. Bill Walsh asked himself a question that I believe most of us get to encounter at least once in our lives, and I call it the Bill Walsh question. How do I win when I do not have the resources the system requires of me to win? I first asked myself the Bill Walsh question about five years ago. This was at a time when I was still at university. And we had just teamed up with two of my classmates. And we decided to do a project together because the two were so incredibly passionate about community work. We had figured that if we could convince our classmates to contribute some money, we would have enough for us to purchase a few books for one of the underprivileged community schools in Kitwe. It was pretty simple, straightforward, and completely doable. So we mapped out all the shanty areas in Kitwe, especially those that were closest to the university, and we embarked on the search for the community school that would ultimately benefit from our book donation. Our first stop was Musonda Compound. And when we had arrived at the school, we were so sure that we had mixed up the directions. What was before us could not possibly be a school. The structure was made of planks and looked like some abandoned chicken run, or at best a makeshift marketplace. When we got closer, we found that it was actually a hive of learning activity. In one of the rooms, there were three classes going on simultaneously. The, roof that, the roofing sheets that were atop of the structure did not cover the, the room completely. And so there was a huge gap that ran through the center of the room from one end to the other. While we were there, it started raining. And like clockwork, the room was divided into two as the ladders moved on either side of the room to avoid the pouring rain. 
I had never seen anything like that in my life. When we went back to the university, one thing was clear. Books were the least of the problems that the school had. Infrastructure was the biggest. And that's when we asked ourselves the Bill Walsh question. How can we solve the infrastructure problem when we do not have the resources required of us to solve it? We made a few calculations, and we said, if each of the 10,000 students at the Copper Belt University could each contribute one kwacha per week, would have 10,000 kwacha each week, and in a month would have 40,000 kwacha, in three months would have 120,000 kwacha, or $12,000, which would be enough for us to build at least one room. That gave us hope. So then we went door to door to the students' hostels and told every student that would give us an audience about our master project, which we called the Piggy Bank Campaign. And our slogan was, your change can change lives. Two years later, we managed to raise enough funding for us to begin construction of the community school. And a lot of it was because when we told a lot of the students at Copper Belt University, many of them supported the idea and offered their skills to help out. The students that were studying architecture said, we'll do the designs for you. Those doing quantity surveying did the bill of quantities. And students from the School of Business helped out with marketing and bookkeeping. Last year in January, we completed construction of three classrooms for Ipusukilo Community School. <laughs> Ipusukilo Community School now has over 700 learners, and they are utilizing these classes that we had built for them. This month, the month of August, we celebrate four years since we started the Piggy Bank campaign. And in those four years, We've managed to set up chapters in three university campuses. The CBU main campus here in Kitwe, the one in Indola, and one at the University of Zambia. Over the past four years, we've reached out to over 3,500 underprivileged learners, and we have mentored over 500 of them. And if you ask any piggy banker today, they will tell you that we have only just begun. Now, remember, Bush had just taken over a subpar team with record-breaking poor performance. The odds of them winning the championship were almost zero. But instead of playing in the steamrolling center force football that he absolutely knew he would lose at, Bill Walsh decided to change the game in his favor. He ordered his players to pass the ball into the edges of the field where there was more room to run and there were rarely ever any defenders in the peripherals of the field. As some analysts have said, Bill Walsh changed what was the orderly ground war of football into an aero bombardment of short zippy passes with faint and darting runs. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how B. Walsh became the ultimate genius of American football. And he's today held as one of the best coaches to have ever lived in America. I believe that if Africa is to develop, we need to change the game in our favor. We need to move from the government center driven development and pass the ball into the ages of citizen driven models where there's less red tape and more room to maneuver. That way, we'll be adapting our limitations and challenges to a style 
that favors our strength. Africa currently has the youngest population in the world. Economists project that by the end of this century, Africa will account for 40% of the world's population. 40%. We need to take advantage of this population boom by changing these young Africans into the ultimate change agents. So that this generation, my generation and yours, will forever be known as the generation that developed Africa. But can this really be done? If it can, how many of these young Africans do we need in the peripherals of the field, passing the ball to each other? A professor from Harvard's Kennedy School of Governance did a paper that looked at all the social movements that had happened from 1900 to 2006. In that paper, she had looked at all the social movements that were successful and either led to social or political change and those that were failed attempts. The research argues that if a movement manages to garner at least 3.5% participation of the total population, it was almost certainly going to succeed. 3.5%. 3.5% of young Africans passing the ball to each other, working to transform the continent, that's what we need. In Zambia, 3.5% of the population amounts to 595,000 people. 595,000 Zambians. But then again, how do we get to this number? And what on God's good earth does any of this stuff have to do with riots? In 1978, a professor from Stanford University wrote a paper he called The Threshold Model of Collective Behavior. The paper was a diagnosis of all riots in order to understand one critical element about riots. And he asked the question, how do riots start? In that paper, three things emerged. One, riots are contagious. Two, they happen in stages. And three, everyone has a threshold at which they'll get into a riot. Put another way, the first person to throw a stone, and I know CBU students know this, <laughs> the first person to throw a stone doesn't need anybody for them to do it. They have a threshold of zero. The second person to throw a stone needs only to see one person throwing a stone for them to pick up one. The third person needs to see two people throwing stones for them to get involved. And before you know it, you have a thousand people throwing stones. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we should go and start a riot. No. <laughs> TV students were getting a little too excited. But I believe that positive social change happens in a similar pattern. It is contagious, happens in stages, and we all have a threshold at which we'll get involved. The first person to have constructed classrooms for a community school may have only been responding to a social need. But the second person needs to see the first person do it for them to also do something for their community. And the third person 
needs to see two people actively involved in transforming their community for them to also participate. And before you know it, you have 595,000 people actively working to transform the country. 595,000 Zambians. That's what we need. 594,999. Because I have counted myself in. And my hope today is that as we leave, you also go out and do something for your community so that the next person will see you do it and they will also get involved. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how we're going to develop Africa. And that is an idea worth spreading. Thank you.